so uh, as you can see my name is shom bhattacharya and i'll be teaching you part of the physics portion for your uh, 11th 12th preparation for entrance exams so this is our introductory physics lecture today in which we'll talk about few broad things about physics but then in particular we will start with a topic called vector analysis or we'll start with a topic called vectors in physics so we'll just have a basic beginning to vectors today but before we get into vectors and all that let's uh, let's talk a little bit about you know the subject itself so if i talk about the subject physics what is the subject really about this is the first thing we should explore over here of course you have been studying physics for a number of years now so you are well aware of lot of things about physics but suppose mai you know i want to explain to somebody jisko physics ke bare mein kuch bhi nahi pata and i want to explain in very simple layman's language very simple terms ki physics kya hota hai as a subject or at least i want to explain to him or her ki physics mein hum kya kya cheeze padhte hain what is the scope of the subject of physics okay? so a simple answer to that is physics is a subject that deals with physics is a study you can say of all physical phenomena in the universe okay so now obviously a lot of questions come that what do we mean by just saying the term study what kind of study we are talking about and what do we mean by physical phenomena the universe to take us we still kind of understand what it is so what is physical phenomena and what is study so by study of course i'll come back to study by physical phenomena phenomena as you know is the plural term for phenomenon so what is a phenomenon a phenomenon is just a very fancy word complicated word for an event okay. or you can say an occurrence so anything that happens any event that happens or any occurrence that happens that is called a phenomenon and the plural of that is phenomena now which type of occurrences or which type of phenomena are called physical so physical word kahan se aata hai yahan pe so all events okay or phenomena okay where physical quantities physical quantities interact with each other okay are called physical phenomena okay so wherever a set of physical quantities or at least one set one physical quantity is interacting with another physical quantity उसको हम क्या कहते हैं फिजिकल फिनोमिना कहते हैं सो फॉर एग्जांपल क्या हो गया वी कैन टेक द सिचुएशन ऑफ फॉर एग्जांपल वी कैन टेक अ हॉट बॉडी लाइक लेट्स से बॉइलिंग वाटर इन अ कंटेनर इन अ कंटेनर इट कम्स इन कांटेक्ट with a cold body so let's say what we are doing is now we are uh, we are placing a cold metallic cube okay into the boiling water so kya ho raha hai a hotter body is coming in contact with a colder object which is the cold that means comparatively its temperature is left less so that is coming in contact with the hot body so why i'm saying this is now a physical phenomena because see what is happening in this one quantity is interacting with another so as we know what will happen is ki from the hot body okay to the cold body there will be transfer of heat okay or heat basically kya hota hai heat is a form of energy so a form of energy transfers from the hotter body to the to the colder body till what happens the temperature of the hotter body 
will tend to decrease and the temperature of the cooler body will tend to increase so you can see how the interaction between physical quantities are happening okay the molecules of the hotter body they are sort of in motion with more kinetic energy that's why uska temperature jada hai whereas the molecules in the colder body are in motion with lot less kinetic energy that's why its temperature is less now you might say that in my example maine cold body ko kya liya hai i've taken it as a chunk of metal as a metallic cube so how come the molecules are in motion inside that it's a solid body the molecules are not moving about like they would be moving about in boiling water it's very true the molecules in a metallic chunk are not moving in the same way that the molecules of boiling water are moving about very 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 true but at the same time it's not correct to say to metallic piece ke molecules bilkul nahi move karte they are moving but they are moving at a very very minute level which is the molecular level if you put them under an electron microscope you will see that those molecules are vibrating okay some of you might have heard the term absolute zero or zero on the kelvin scale that is a hypothetical uh, or that is a theoretical temperature at which molecular motion stops that means if i were to bring that uh, metallic body to a temperature of zero kelvin which you know is minus 273 degrees c or zero kelvin only then i can say that theoretically the molecules of that solid would stop vibrating but since zero kelvin or minus 273 is not possible in practical physics so we know that every body every material at any temperature which actually exists which really exists in the practical world is always in a state of motion the molecules are always moving they might be moving so so little that we are not able to observe that in the macroscopic world like the vibration of the molecules of a solid but they are still under motion so what is happening here is that this body is colder because the vibrational kinetic energy of the solid molecules wo kya hai wo kafi kam hai compared to the kinetic energy of the water molecules which are in boiling water so what kind of kinetic energy the water molecules have they have what we call translational kinetic energy because as you would have studied in 9 10 when when we boil a liquid it sets up trans, uh, or when it comes close to boiling point it sets up what we call convectional currents that is within the liquid so if this is a jar of liquid which we are heating from below over here we are supplying heat so it will set up convection currents within the liquid where the hotter molecules will tend to come up and the cooler molecules will tend to go down and there is a continuous streaming kind of motion of liquid molecules that occur and the higher the temperature the faster that translational motion is so as if fast moving molecules jab contact mein aate hain with a metallic block which has hardly got much motion in comparison the molecules are vibrating but they are vibrating with very less kinetic energy So immediately, what happens? Energy transfers from the faster moving molecules of water to the cooler molecules of the solid metal, and that form of energy is what we call heat. Okay, yeah, Kunal. So good. I have uh, come to the first question. Uh, yeah, in space, Kunal, the temperature is not minus two seventy three. Actually, the temperature will be very close to minus two seventy three, but it is not sub. Uh, sub zero temperature when we talk about scale we are talking about the the centigrade current temperature okay in space also the temperature in kelvin is above zero kelvin or in degree c is slightly above minus 273 so body is moving in space then molecules also have or you know if you have a body of liquid which is floating about in space the liquid molecules do have kinetic energy but that is much 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 slower compared to the liquid molecules on the surface of the earth which would be closer to room temperature or something like that Okay. In fact, in space, uh, liquids would freeze. You know, they they would solidify. So water, a, a, a body of water would immediately freeze into ice, and at a very very low temperature, at something like minus two seventy or minus two sixty five or something like that, and the molecules would be very close to their state of absolute zero. Right, Kunal. So hope that answers your question. Yeah. Yeah, so coming back to that, I'm just taking an example of a physical phenomena. So here, my physical physical phenomena is what it is heat transfer. So why I'm saying it is a physical phenomena because you can see physical quantities are interacting with each other. You have one physical quantity which is the temperature of the hot body, let's say T1. You have another physical quantity which is the temperature of the colder body, which is T2. You have another physical quantity which is the heat supplied Q. Okay. Now you can also see there's a relation between heat. and how the temperature of this body will tend to increase it will become t2 plus some delta t let's say whereas the temperature of this body will tend to decrease it will become t1 minus delta t1 let's say and this one will become t2 plus delta t2 so next we will see that there is a particular relationship between how much heat is getting supplied in terms of how much this one's temperature is decreasing and in terms of the, how much this one's temperature is increasing 
So both of these are somehow related. Delta T1 is related or we can say proportional to delta T2, which is proportional to the amount of heat supplied, which is heat which is getting transferred from one body to the other. And finally, we'll see that the amount of heat transferred is also proportional to things like the mass of the cold body or the mass of the hotter body and the material of the hotter body, something called specific heat capacity. So these are some of the terms you might be familiar with. But my point over here is not so much about the thermodynamics part over here or the heat transfer part. My point is more that why this is a physical quantity because we can see various physical, sorry, why it's a physical phenomena because you can see various physical quantities like temperature, heat, mass, specific heat capacity, etc. They are affecting each other. Now, they are affecting each and they are interacting with each other. That's why this comes in the category of a, a physical phenomena. Another example you might take of a physical phenomena is uh, something more to do with, let's say, mechanical things like forces. Now, let's say you have something like a carom board. Okay. This is the top of a carom board. Carom is a very popular game nowadays because all of us are locked up at home. So it's good to play carom with our family and friends and whoever we can. Now, let's say this is one of the coins. And this is another coin. Now, this coin is headed towards this one. So one of the, the pieces of the carom board is headed towards this one with a certain velocity. So it, it will come and strike this. Okay. So you can see that initially the, the two points, they are, if you draw more magnified diagram, so a coin here, or suppose the coin that strike initially here. It's at a position like this. Okay. Now we'll see something very interesting that if the velocity of this is directly like this, such that this kind of velocity vector here, now I'm sure most of you have played carom, so you'll be able to relate it to this. So, you do move kar hai, if that motion is happening along the center to center line, the center of this one is let's say C2, the center of this one is C1. So, if this velocity is directly along that center to center line, then typically what will tend to happen is that after they strike each other, Immediately after they strike each other, what will tend to happen is this one will tend to continue along that same line, that same dotted line which I have drawn here. And the other one might stop or it might even recoil back. But more importantly, both these, the motion will continue along the same line. So we can say it is a what we call a one-dimensional system or a motion where a system where the motion is occurring along a straight line. Okay. So this would be what in everyday language in Karam we call a direct shot. Okay. Whereas a more interesting example would be, suppose we were to strike the coin in such a way that it is what we call a tangent shot. Right? We try to hit it tangentially. So this coin is here and this coin is here. Now suppose as this is approaching, its velocity vector is center ke taraf nahi hai. It is slightly off center, right? something like this. So its its velocity is line is like this. It's not along the center. It's not passing through the center. So then you will see something more interesting that happens now. That when they strike each other, okay, then there is an interaction between them, which we call force or impulse or whatever. But that interaction will occur because they are like two discs. So wo interaction force jo hai, wo kiske along act karega? Firstly, this will come and strike here. So it will strike somewhere like this. So as it strikes like this, now what will happen is that the center to center line at that point of time is this line. Even though the velocity or the motion of this one was not along this line, you can see it was along a different line. Now the motion was along some line like this. So, kya hoga? Ye is pe jo impulse lagayega, jo ya jo force lagayega, that will be along this line. And by Newton's third law, this will apply an equal and opposite impulse on this. So, we can call this an F delta T, a force into some very short amount of time delta T for which they are in contact. So, this quantity F delta T, we will study at a later stage in physics. This is called impulse. In this case, it is what we call a collision impulse because there is a collision between the two carom points that is happening. So, ye jo collision impulse ho hai. Uske what will happen is that immediately after the collision is over, we will see that the situation is now something like this. This coin 
and this point will now separate from each other and as this separate iska velocity ab aisa kuch direction mein ho sakta hai because it was going like this and then it was struck by something like this so what will happen is its direction of velocity will change whereas the other one's velocity will be along the impulse it will be along the center to center so after the impact let's say this one gets a velocity v2 and the original one gets a velocity v1 so you can see that they are along different lines this is along this this is along this point is coming trying to we applied a force in, in this sort of direction only so its direction of motion changed from this to this now just imagine something moving like this and then it is heavily struck with some, something pointing in this direction as uh, something you know it is going along this kind of a direction this is its velocity before getting hit but then it is struck with a force which is let's say along this kind of direction the direction of that force that impulse is in this sort of direction yeah i'm coming to the doubt just a moment so uske wajah se kya hoga iska direction of motion change hoga it was going like this and it struck like this so now its direction will change to something like this okay where is the other one what is happening to the other one that one was at rest it was at rest and then it was struck with an impulse that was equal and opposite like this so as a result of that what happened it will just continue in this direction it 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 will continue to move off in that particular kind of direction right okay so guys if uh, at any point of time uh, you know the the what shall i say the, <coughs> the voice breaks or the video connection starts lagging a little then don't worry uh, it's because of the internet connectivity issue it could be at your end it could be at my end whatever but uh, the the lectures being recorded don't worry so later when you go through the stream of the recorded lecture you will get uh, the, the full version without any breaks and things like that okay all right so now this is which kind of an interaction this is an in type of interaction in physics that we call collision and you can see that depending on the angle at which the collision is happening now this this is an example of what we call a uh, one dimensional collision it's something we'll study a few months from now in physics it's a one dimensional or sometimes we also call it a head on okay it's a head on collision or a head on impact so in a head on impact what happens is that the final velocities of the two bodies collide in after impact this one is b2 and this one is coming back but it's along the same line so the final velocities are along the same line so that is why it is called one dimensional because ha huh, delta t is like a very short time so here where is in this i am coming to delta t there is in the second example this is an example of what we call a oblique collision oblique collision ka matlab kya hota hai jo collision ho raha hai it is not happening along the center to center line you can see the center to center line is this one but the collision is happening along this line okay the initial velocity of this one is along this line so whenever there is an oblique collision what happens is that the velocities are at some angle after the impact they are not along the same line you can see that this is going in this direction this is going in this direction so inke beech kuch aisa theta ho gaya they are not along the same line okay so so this occurs because of what we call an oblique collision now i will just refresh the screen for a moment this hang on let's okay. right so what i was explaining over there in terms of impulse impulse due to a force This is explained. The impulse is defined by F into delta t, where delta t. So the term delta is used for what? This is read as delta, and it is used to explain change. Okay. So when we say delta x, it means a change in x. When we say delta t, it means a change in t. So over here, when we are saying that impulse. 
So in this example, when we are saying that impulse is equal to F delta T. So over here F is force and that delta T is a time interval or a change in time. So in the case of a collision, what we mean by the time interval or change in time is something very simple. What we mean by it is it is a very short duration of time okay. for which the colliding bodies are in contact is called delta t in the context of collision so for example if one object rolling around the ground comes in contact with another one now while they are in contact, okay, while they are in contact, let us say that contact time is, let us say, 2 microseconds, very very short duration of time, micro is 1 millionth, you know, 1 upon 100,000, <coughs> sorry, 1 upon 1000,000, 10 raised by 3000 or million. Okay. So this is the duration of contact and while it is in contact they are in contact let's say this guy is applying a force on this and this guy is applying an equal and opposite force on this and let's say f is the average impact force and let's say the force is let's say whatever 200 newtons Then if I ask myself, what is the collision impulse? Collision impulse kitna hai? So the answer to this will become the collision impulse is F delta T. So it will be 200 Newtons multiplied by 2 microseconds. So that will be 400 Newton microseconds. Okay. Which we can further write as 400 kilogram meter per second sweat that is Newton into microsecond okay. so we can write that as 400 into 10 raised power minus 6 kilogram meter per second square into second I have converted this microsecond into this because 1 microsecond is 1 upon 1 million seconds or 10 raised power minus 6 seconds. So that is the definition of microsecond. So I am just giving you a typical example. Right? And in actual collision between two carom coins, something like this will happen. The actual time for which the two coins are in contact will be very, very short. It will be of the order of microseconds. Okay. Uh, right, Mehir, I have just got your message that you have entered late into the class. So don't worry, we actually haven't started the topic yet. And we are just having a general discussion. So just join in and you will follow in a bit of time. With my next example, you will follow. So we, we will come to the uh, the topic in a bit. The topic is going to be vectors. Okay. But there is a reason why I am you know, starting with all this discussion. So that when we get into vectors, you have a good introduction into what we are trying to do. Actually. Okay. So anyway, so the two carom coins as they come in contact, if the average force with which they interact is 200 newtons. But look, while they are in contact, they are touching each other. They are applying a sort of average force of 200 newtons on each other, action reaction pair. So those are the forces which I have shown with these two arrows over here. But they are in contact for how much time? Very, very short amount of time. Two microseconds you can imagine is very, very short. So you actually need a very sophisticated kind of clock to even measure two microseconds. The kind of sports stop watches and all that people use for Olympics and all, that goes up to milliseconds. That hardly ever goes to microseconds. Okay? So we need something very, very sophisticated, some very you know, technically advanced kind of equipment to measure two microseconds. But suppose, okay, if we say that is two microseconds, so collision impulse ke kya ho jayega? It will be F into delta T. So in SI units, it will its value will become two hundred newtons into two micro. So my micro will become two into ten raised power minus six. So that is where this is coming. So it will become four into ten raised power minus four, as you can see, okay. kilogram meter per second. That will become the unit. 
बिकॉज इट इज फोर्स इन टू टाइम फोर्स का यूनिट क्या है के जी मीटर पर सेकेंड स्क्वायर एंड इन टू टाइम इज सेकेंड सो इट बिकम्स के जी मीटर पर सेकेंड सो दैट एज बी विल सी लेटर इज द एस आई यूनिट फॉर द क्वान्टिटी इम्पल्स सो दिस इज वॉट वी मीन बाई इम्पल्स सो नी वे कमिंग बैक टू वॉट पॉइंट आई वॉज ट्राइंग टू एक्सप्लेन ओवर हियर The point I was trying to explain was that this is another example of a physical phenomenon. Because what is a physical phenomenon? It is an occurrence or an event, okay, whereby physical quantities interact. So in my example of a collision of one carom point with another one. whether it was the case of the direct collision which was the first one i had taken so after impact what is happening this one is going in this direction this one is recoiling back in this sort of direction okay or it was the case of the what we call the oblique collision dono mein se jo bhi ho it is a case of this one ki ye aise ja raha hai so its velocity vectors along this and the second point doesn't quite lie on that lies a little bit like this so that's why what will happen is here after impact the second point will go off in this sort of a direction and the first one will go off in this sort of a direction so they will go off obliquely okay but jo bhi ho yahan pe kya ho raha hai that the first coin carom coin that is it has some it strikes with a certain initial what we call linear momentum or simply momentum okay so that is mass into velocity so let's say its mass is m1 and its initial velocity was v then what happens is it applies impulse f delta t on the second one which is m2 let's say and experiences you know a reaction impulse that is also magnitude f delta t but in the opposite direction and as a result of that kya ho raha hai the first one first one's momentum changes okay it changes from whatever the initial momentum was m1 v to whatever the final momentum is m1 v1 and the second one which was at rest initially now this second one develops momentum no you don't need to note down so okay, i will tell you when you need to note down that's it and i will give you enough time we haven't started the topic yet and plus i will be giving you a pdf of this whiteboard so if you want to go over these examples later uh, you can go in the in detail okay we haven't started the topic yet so you need not note down on this this is just for a sort of introduction for us to understand the language of physics and things like that in particular so it develops momentum so momentum kya hota hai momentum is denoted by the symbol p and it is mass into velocity where have you heard the term momentum before momentum apne kahan pe suna hai pehle can you tell me i'm sure all of you have heard about momentum in some very fundamental equation do you remember the name momentum from somewhere some equation it's a very famous equation in physics think and tell me once thoda so, सोचिए और बताइए वेर हैव यू हर्ड द टर्म मोमेंटम यस वेरी गुड वेरी गुड रचित एनीबडी एल्स यस वेरी गुड श्वेता यस जस्ट दैट्स करेक्ट एक्सेलेंट एनी वन एल्स पीपल Okay, so I will give you a quick reminder. Many of you have answered. That's correct. So momentum, you have heard the term in Newton's second law. Newton's second law. Me, what is the correct statement actually? It is not F is equal to m a. F is equal to m a is a formula for it. The correct statement of Newton's second law is that the net external force okay, on a body. equals to the rate of change 
the rate of change of its momentum e statement okay so when we convert this into a formula what happens is that we say the net force acting on it is equal to rate of change now rate of change ka matlab kya hota hai change in momentum divided by change in time okay. where p is momentum and t is time just like we say that acceleration is rate of change of velocity displacement or rather velocity is rate of change of displacement with respect to time like that rate of change of momentum kya ho jayega delta p by delta t that is the meaning of the term rate of change of momentum so okay so now what happens is we know momentum is equal to mass into velocity where generally okay such that for a rigid body something which is not changing shape and size that's a rigid body m mass is constant okay so next step what we say that okay if net force is equal to change in momentum divided by change in time it will become change in mass into velocity that is what linear momentum is this is the term momentum so it becomes this upon delta t now if we apply this condition that mass is constant because we are talking about a rigid body तुम क्या कहेंगे यहाँ पे दिस क्वांटिटी विल नाउ बिकम मास इनटू चेंज इन वेलोसिटी ना बिकॉज़ मास इज अ कांस्टेंट सो इट जस्ट कम्स आउटसाइड सॉरी मास इनटू चेंज इन वेलोसिटी डिवाइडेड बाय चेंज इन टाइम एंड जस्ट नाउ यू आर टॉकिंग व्हाट इज चेंज इन वेलोसिटी अपॉन चेंज इन टाइम दैट इज नथिंग बट एक्सीलरेशन सो वी गेट दैट फेमस इक्वेशन f is equal to ma बट रिमेंबर दैट इक्वेशन इज कंडीशनल व्हेन कैन आई से दैट नेट फोर्स इज मास इनटू एक्सीलरेशन this can only be said under the specific condition that only when mass m of the body is constant so for example we cannot apply this equation to a conveyor belt because conveyor belt mein kya ho raha hai mass constantly add ho raha hai okay or we cannot apply this equation to a tanker from which water is leaking out because the mass of the tanker is changing so that is how we'll apply newton second law that's a whole different matter it's a very interesting thing aur hum ye baad mein padhenge ki agar mass variable hoga to net force aur acceleration mein kya relation ha very good that's correct that's very good example that just says given that also a rocket a rocket is an example of a variable mass system the rocket is constantly throwing out burning gases at a very high rate and in fact by ejecting those burning gases at a high rate the rocket generates something called thrust Now, आपने टर्म सुना होगा थ्रस्ट द थ्रस्ट जनरेटेड बाय द रॉकेट्स इंजन इज इक्वल टू सो मेनी न्यूटन्स और सो मेनी किलोग्राम फोर्स लाइक दैट दे एक्सप्रेस सो दैट दैट आल्सो कम्स पार्टली बाय अप्लाइंग दिस इक्वेशन बट इन अ डिफरेंट टाइप ऑफ सिस्टम वेयर मास इज वेरिएबल सो यू हैव टू रिमेंबर एज फिजिक्स स्टूडेंट्स f is equal to ma is what we apply 99% of the time in given problems but there will be a very small set of problems where m will not be constant and for those we will learn later how to interpret this this is the actual law that net force kya hai rate of change of momentum ye law se ye equation jo hai ma ye kahan se aaya ye special condition se aaya that we are assuming mass is constant okay so this itself you can see is a physical phenomenon now force kya hai it is a physical quantity which causes the momentum to change so when the force acts on one body it interacts with that body in such a way that one of its physical properties or one of the physical quantities jo ki body ka property hai जो कि क्या है उसका मोमेंटम है या जो कि क्या है उसका वेलोसिटी है सो दैट चेंजेस बिकॉज़ ऑफ इंटरेक्शन विद अन अदर फिजिकल क्वांटिटी व्हिच इज फोर्स सो नाउ एनी एंड एवरीथिंग यू कैन थिंक ऑफ लाइक दिस वेयर फिजिकल क्वांटिटीज आर अफेक्टिंग ईच अदर इलेक्ट्रिकल सर्किट्स ओके एयर कंडीशनिंग ऑफ अ रूम यू कैन थिंक ऑफ सो मेनी अदर्स ठीक है यू कैन थिंक ऑफ मैग्नेटिज्म ओके यू ऑल ऑफ यू नो द फैरेडेज इफेक्ट दैट व्हेन अ कंडक्टिंग लूप the magnetic field through it is changing then what happens a electric current is generated or electric voltage is generated you might have heard of something called the ac generator you know where what happens you take a, a coil of current or a, a conducting coil and it is made to rotate you know the coil yes electromagnetic induction that's it so a, a coil is made to rotate inside a magnetic field that is something for example you can do using a dynamo okay and that generates electrical current so again you can see one quantity is interacting with another the magnetic field is interacting with the coil creating something called flux that you would have studied and the flux is changing with time because the coil is rotating 
So the motion of the coil is interacting with that flux in such a way that is generating yet another physical quantity, which is voltage, and that voltage is generating current. So these are all examples. So basically, everything we see in the physical universe around us. When we talk about even chemistry, you know, bonding that is happening between molecules or a chemical reaction that is happening between two elements. Ultimately, what is happening? There are actual at the molecular level there are interaction between the electrons which are in the outermost orbit of the so-called atoms. And that interaction is again happening through what kind of quantity? It is happening through the electromagnetic interaction between protons and electrons. Okay, at, in the atom, what is responsible for the orbital molecules of the electrons? Just give us some kind of these electrons are valence electrons, and certain electrons are electron. Certain atoms are electron negative. Certain atoms are electro positive. So they might be forming covalent bond in certain cases. They might be forming ionic bond in certain cases. Now certain elements are. Uh, classified as metals because they have one or two electrons in the valence orbit whereas certain elements will be classified as non-metals because they have larger number of electrons but ultimately what is happening over there when we talk about electron negativity when we talk about conducting property when we talk about valency these are all physical quantities so they are all physical phenomena so they all come under the domain of physics okay so literally when we say physics covers all physical phenomena of the universe what we, we are trying to say is that physics covers everything in the universe so now the question might be okay if you are saying everything then why say physical phenomena i should just say everything in the universe so my answer to that is no there are certain things that physics doesn't cover and those are what non physical phenomena so what is a non physical phenomena for example i have you know something like my emotions okay, they are getting affected by someone's let's say conversation somebody is saying something to me is say mera emotions affect hoga now can i say so two things are interacting emotions and conversation or you can say communication in dono ke beech interaction ho raha hai two way interaction ho raha hai but is this physical is this a set of physical quantities the answer is no they are not so therefore will this come in the domain of physics no the answer is no it will not come but the working of an electrical circuit yes the working of a radio antenna set yes the working of your mobile phone the working of video encoding the working of our communication which is happening through zoom all this is in the domain of physics because there are ultimately physical phenomena which are interacting with each other and affecting each other and that is how the system is progressing okay so as you can understand physics covers a lot of ground okay physics covers all physical phenomena and there's a huge spectrum now at the smallest end of the spectrum on one hand you have particle physics now particle physics may you have things like you know you have things like higgs boson okay or you have neutrinos they extremely small and on the other hand you have the domain of astrophysics astrophysics is huge it's, it's it's a huge huge domain because you can imagine that here in in the domain of astrophysics one light year is actually a very small quantity because if you talk about galaxies and all they are several million light years apart among them so can you imagine what one light year is it's a unit of distance one light year is the distance traveled by light in one year so it is 3 lakh kilometers per second or 3 into 10 days per 8 meters per second multiplied by 60 seconds per minute multiplied by 60 minutes per hour multiplied by 24 hours per day multiplied by 365 so it's this amount of time so it is basically this amount of distance in meters the meter per second multiplied by seconds so it's a huge huge distance but in in context of astrophysics this is a very very small unit in astrophysics we regularly come across distances which are millions of light years apart whereas when you talk about you know things in particle physics then you are going very very small extremely small here a distance of one fermi would be actually a very large distance because one fermi which is 1 into 10 raised power minus 15 meters this is roughly the average diameter of a nucleus an atom's nucleus okay 
Yeah, it should be showing better. Okay. Wait, I'll share the screen again. It should be showing. Uh, Diti, is it showing now in the screen? Are you receiving the whiteboard? Okay. Uh, Diti, uh, if you can just try this once. Just, uh, just log out of Zoom and log back in. Might be a problem with your uh, Zoom connection at this point. So just log out and use the same uh, ID and password and log back in, and I'm sure you will get the. Okay. Don't worry, I'm right here, okay. and you'll be able to use the same password. Right. So in in the domain of uh, particle physics, actually, you do one for me. For me is the short form we use for femtometer. Okay. This is actually a very large distance because something like a neutrino is much, much smaller than a nucleus. A nucleus itself is one Fermi. And you know, a nucleus can contain several protons and neutrons and all that. And protons and neutrons are very, very large compared to a particle like a neutrino or a Higgs boson. If you compare a, a neutron with a Higgs boson, it is, it is like comparing you know, one of the moons of Saturn or something with the size of the of the Sun, there's that much difference in size. Okay, so actually one Fermi is a very very large unit of distance in the domain of. Okay, good to know, Diti. So you're getting the whiteboard screen right now, right? Good. So this is one of the things with online lectures. You know, once in a while you have to deal with these problems, but as long as you let me know that you're having some problem, I'll help you out with it. Okay. Yeah. So coming back to this, you can see how much contrast there is between the two. Fermi unit because the actual particles we are dealing with, like Higgs boson and neutrinos and fermions and all that, are very, very small compared to one Fermi. But here, one light year in astrophysics, one light year is actually a very small unit. The actual distances we are dealing with are much, much, much larger compared to one light year. And physics covers these two at the two ends of the spectrum and everything in between. So it covers a huge amount of ground. And what, what the, the part of physics that we need for engineering is a very small section within that. In engineering and everyday technology, the part of physics that we need is a very small part of this entire spectrum of physics, which is going from particle physics to all the way to astrophysics. Okay. So that, that is the scope of physics and that is the width of physics. And that is something I wanted to just discuss with you. Ha, Higgs boson. Okay. Higgs boson. It is one of the smallest sub nuclear particles. Known to mankind. Okay. It was discovered in the CERN lab particle accelerator. And it, it was observed during a very, very high energy collision experiment. Okay. So, so that is what the Higgs boson is about. It is, it's like one of the most famous particles in physics. Uh, if you go through physics uh, articles and things from newspapers about till about three, four years back, Higgs boson was the most, uh, one of the most uh, hot topics that were talked about. Okay. That's why I brought it up okay. just to arouse your curiosity a little bit. Not that it's part of our syllabus because particle physics is something that you can study only at a much later stage in physics. Okay. First, you need to understand a lot of things in physics, but I'm just trying to explain the scope of physics over here. Okay. So now coming back to physical phenomena and we saw what physical phenomena physical phenomena are things that are to do with physical quantities and they are affecting each other okay. so next thing you'll see that what is a physical quantity when do we say a quantity is physical when it is it can be measured okay so any quantity that can be measured 
is called a physical quantity. So, example, it could be volume, it could be mass, it could be charge, it could be electric current, okay. it could be force, it, it could be momentum. Okay. So, anything that can be measured, we say it is a physical quantity. But now I'm going to ask you something. When we talk about, on the one hand, we have a physical quantity called displacement. And we have another physical quantity called distance. Can you tell me the difference between these two? What is the difference between these two? Because we measure this in meters. Mein measure karte. SI unit meters. Hota hai. Iska bhi SI unit meters. Hota hai. But are they the same thing? Are they same? Or if not, how are they different? Very good, Diti. That's the correct answer. So now I'm coming closer to the topic that we are going to study, the first topic. Yes, correct. Very good. So they are not the same. So how are they different then? Yes, just that is the correct explanation. Kunal, that's also the correct explanation. Okay. So they are not the same. Okay. So now let me give you an example further. Okay. Yes, Kunal, that is correct. So just to summarize what all of you people are saying, which is the correct answer, of course, that displacement is the shortest path or the straight line joining the initial position with the final position of a moving object. So if a moving object moves from the point A to the point B. So suppose this is the initial position of a particle and this is the final position. So when we are calculating displacement, we are not concerned with how the particle reaches from A to B. We are just concerned with two things. What is the initial position and what is the final position? So our displacement becomes what? It becomes this straight line. In fact, it becomes an arrow. We will very soon be studying about vector arrows and we will learn the significance of the arrow also. But for now, we can just think of it like you know, everyday definition that we studied in 9 and 10 that it is the straight path or the shortest path you can say from the initial position to final position. So that we denote by the symbol S and we typically use the symbol S for displacement. Okay. Whereas, what about distance travel? Now, distance is a bit different. Distance cannot be determined by just looking at initial position and final position. The distance traveled, which let's say I'm using the symbol D for, it is basically what? It is the path length. It is not the shortest path or it's not the straight line joining initial and final. It is the actual path traveled by the particle or the body. So if the particle or body is actually going along this path, okay, and it goes from here to here and it finally reaches here, then that is called the distance travel. Okay, so to calculate the distance travel, what I will have to do is I will have to measure this path length. So this path length is the actual the actual length of the path traveled by the body from A to B. So you can see that distance and displacement are different and in a certain situation distance might be equal to displacement. If the actual path traveled was this straight line, then my distance and displacement would be the same. But if the actual path traveled is something else, then obviously distance will become more than displacement. Okay. Now let's understand one more key difference about distance and displacement, which many of you have actually pointed out. Okay. But let's explore this through, through an example. So, example, in case one, I'm telling that, let's say, a person, let's say Amit, okay, travels a distance D1 equal to 5 kilometers from 12 noon to 1 p.m. And then a further distance D2 equal to 2.5 kilometers 
from 1 pm to 2 30 pm. Okay. Whereas I'll take another case now. The same guy Amit. Amit's displacement was only let's say two kilometers from 12 to 1 and was S2 equal to let's say this is S1 so his displacement S1 was kilometers okay. and S2 was 1.5 kilometers from 1 to 230. Okay. Now I ask you that in this one find the total distance traveled from 12 And in this one, as you find the net displacement from 12 to 230. Okay. Now try this and you will come, you will come to the point that I am making about distance and displacement. Why they are very different actually. You will understand through this example more. <clears throat> so if you like, you can note down this problem and just Try out, uh, try it, and give me the answer. <coughs> That's correct. Yes, that is correct. Okay, so <clears throat> Yash Kunal Tej uh, You are all partially correct. Okay, In the sense that you can calculate the distance in the first place. It will be 5 plus 2.5. So it will be 7.5. But what about the net displacement in the second case? <coughs> can we actually say what the net displacement is? Because we don't know the direction. That's very good. Just that is the correct thing. So here what is happening is in this case we know that the net distance traveled will be D1 plus D2. So it will be 7.5 kilometers. But here the problem is the net displacement we have no idea about. Because we have no idea about the directions. Okay. So that is what is actually showing us the major difference between what is the quantity displacement and what is the quantity distance. Okay. In fact, what I will tell you here is that what is the meaning that I have given displacement hai, 2 kilometers. That is not complete. This is an incomplete definition. Okay. This is an incomplete measurement. It's not a complete measurement. Okay. It is an incomplete value or it's an incomplete measurement. 
And so why it is incomplete? Because I have given the unit and I have given the value. So it's a complete measurement. But I'll explain next. Okay. Now suppose in the same question, other suppose in the same question, I have said this. That suppose I said that S1 was two kilometers towards east. Okay, and S2. And S2 was 1.5 kilometers towards west. And now I ask you, what is the net displacement? Now, what is the answer you would get over here? What is the answer we would get over here, people? It would be 0.5. That's correct, na? Because one east ke taraf hai, one west ke taraf hai. So now I would see that the net displacement would be 0.5 towards east. Okay. So why I'm able to say that? Because this is a complete definition. Now this value that I've given you of displacement, this is a complete measurement. Why? Because both something called magnitude and direction are expressed. Dono cheese ke bare mein information diya. Magnitude and direction. Okay. So that is why it is a complete definition. So now you can clearly understand that okay, what is happening is suppose my reference directions of north, south, east, west are like this. मैंने मान लिया सपोज मेरा y एक्सिस जो है वो साउथ टू नॉर्थ जा रहा है ठीक है और मेरा x एक्सिस जो है वेस्ट से ईस्ट जा रहा है ओके देन आई कैन सी दैट माय फर्स्ट डिस्प्लेसमेंट सो ही स्टार्टेड फ्रॉम हियर सपोज एट 12 पीएम देन आई कैन सी दैट ओके ही वुड हैव मेड अ डिस्प्लेसमेंट एंड रीच समवे हियर लेट अस से एट 1:30 पीएम Whatever one pm, do we have? But more importantly, this is two kilometers. Then what would happen? He would from there he would turn his direction and go westwards. But by how much? One point five kilometers. So he would now reach somewhere here. Let's just say I'm separating the arrow a little bit, but basically he has reached here. So this is his position now at 2:30 p.m. because he's come back 1.5 kilometers towards west. So now, what is his net displacement in this whole thing? His net displacement is becoming this. It's becoming this arrow. This is his net displacement, and that is why I'm able to say confidently that net displacement is 0.5 kilometers east. Same way, suppose I had in this example, instead of this, I taken suppose it was uh, S one was two kilometers north, okay. and S two was one point five kilometers west. Okay. So find the net displacement. So tell me how much you get in this case. थोड़ा सा गड़बड़ किया कैलकुलेशन यश यू गॉट द आंसर ऑलमोस्ट करेक्ट बट लिटिल बिट या कुनाल इट्स करेक्ट यश यू प्रोवाइड द स्क्वायर रूट क्रिश करेक्ट
yes yes correct now you forgot the square root now yes pythagoras theorem okay that's what you're applying now so now in the same diagram we'll understand ki pehle wo kya kar raha hai he is making a displacement of 2 km northwards so you would have gone north S1 is 2 kilometers towards north. So that means this is where he was at 12 noon, and this is where he ends up after making that displacement at 1 p.m. And thereafter he does what? He turns towards west, but he goes only 1.5 kilometers. So he makes a displacement of magnitude 1.5 kilometers, but this time pointing west. Okay. So he reaches at this position at 2:30 p.m. Now go by the definition. If we are net displacement, what will happen? Displacement is defined as the straight line joining the initial to the final position. So that will be nothing but this. We just have to use coordinate geometry or Pythagoras theorem or anything like that. So this will be the net displacement, and we can calculate that with 290 degrees. So we can see that the square root of 2 square plus 1.5 square. So we can take that as 4 plus 2.25 square root of 6.25. 2.5 kilometers. Okay. Now, as far as the direction is concerned. now the direction will become little bit more complicated because you can see ki net displacement ka jo direction hai wo it is somewhere in between north and west so if this is west and that one is north there will be some angle theta here okay so we'll have to find a way of finding theta so it will be at some theta if we don't know so at some theta north of west that will be the direction So I'll come back to this also. How to calculate theta? At a at a later stage, we will learn that this particular angle theta will actually be fifty three degrees, around fifty three degrees. But that I know from something else. You know, that's that's a different matter. So I'll come back to that. How to calculate theta in this case? So in this case, so anyway, hope these two <coughs> sub examples are clear to all of you. So I'm just putting this up once more so you can go through this whole thing. So first of all, you can understand that in this case we cannot calculate displacement because there is we have no idea about direction. So ये information सब निकाल ही नहीं सकते हैं कि net displacement क्या है. But suppose इसके साथ मैंने additionally ये information दिया होता. In one case it is east and west. So then the net displacement would have been point five. And in another case suppose the displacements were in perpendicular direction like this one one was towards north and one was towards west then the net displacement becomes like the hypotenuse of that right angle triangle so it in fact becomes 2.5 km by pi by this so sorry now so what this is showing us over here is that when i define displacement i need to define its direction okay so the conclusion of this is the conclusion is that displacement is a physical quantity so it's definitely it's measured but in order to measure it i accurately it is defined by a direction and magnitude But in everyday language, we just say that displacement has direction and magnitude. It has both the properties. Magnitude का मतलब क्या होता है? Amount, like that value in kilometers. That is the magnitude. But the magnitude alone is not enough to define the displacement. We have to also define direction. So it is not direction or magnitude. It is and. So therefore, it is what we call a vector quantity. Vectors or vector quantities. are physical quantities we 
which are defined which are defined by both magnitude and direction and the direction if i give only magnitude the definition is incomplete if i give only mag, uh, direction without giving magnitude the direction the, the definition is incomplete so this is the definition of what a vector is okay whereas scalars okay, or scalar quantities these quantities are they are physical quantities which are defined by a magnitude only no direction so this is where officially our chapter now starts the chapter is vectors or vector analysis so it starts with the definition of vectors and scalars so what is a vector quantity or a vector it is a physical quantity which has to be defined by both magnitude and direction whereas what is a scalar quantity or a scalar it is a physical quantity that is defined only by magnitude and no direction so examples of scalars are distance that we just saw mass okay time volume so many other things okay density electric charge whereas examples of vector quantities which are both magnitude and direction the first example we saw is displacement okay force okay velocity and so on and so on okay so if you like you can just make a note down of this part so this is where our chapter is actually starting okay so we should make a brief note of the definition of vector versus the definition of scalar a uh, work is a scalar quantity beta work has the same kind of relation as uh, as uh, this thing energy okay work and energy are scalar quantities okay in fact we will understand very soon why work is a scalar quantity work is defined on the basis of two vectors which is force and displacement but the definite the relationship between force and displacement to get work is such that you ultimately work comes out to be a scalar quantity another way to understand why work is a scalar quantity suppose a body has kinetic energy of 50 joules and we do a work of 20 joules on it so its kinetic energy will increase to how much 70 na no? aur kuch to nahi ho sakta so it doesn't depend on any kind of direction whereas we just saw that if we have already got a displacement of 2 kilometers and we want to add a displacement of 1.5 kilometers we need to know the direction without that we cannot add the displacements so whenever you are confused about a certain quantity being uh, being a vector or a scalar you can just ask yourself this that if i have to add two quantities add two values of that quantity do i need to know the direction yes just very good your explanation is correct it is defined by something called dot product we will come to that later now diti coming to your question this is a good question and everybody can explore this should electric current be a vector or a scalar just think and tell me should electric current be a vector or a scalar okay rachit correct yes very good just that's correct okay so you people have heard this this term called tensor quantity it is actually a scalar electric current is not a tensor there are other tensor quantities like moment of inertia etc now ten, so just just to give you some general knowledge a tensor okay tensors are spelled like this tensor is a third category of material of uh, physical quantities a tensor is a quantity which is neither a vector nor a scalar okay 
neither vector nor scalar okay. and at a later stage i will give you a brief explanation of what tensor is okay but as such it is not part of our uh, high school level physics uh, it, it comes in higher physics and in engineering tensor quantities are not going to be of concern for us in this syllabus of physics however i will give you a explanation of what a tensor quantity is other than this definition that is neither vector nor scalar i'll give you a, a, an example later okay but coming back to electric current electric current is very much a scalar quantity okay now you might disagree with me and say that no no sir current has a direction it always flows from higher potential to lower potential but then i will ask you a simple Thing that suppose we have the junction of a circuit in which there are three wires attached. Okay. Now this is carrying a current of five amperes. Suppose this is carrying a current of two amperes. Suppose and this is carrying some current I three. Now ask you how much would be I three? You can see here how much I three will be. There will be conservation of charge. Okay. So the incoming current should equal to the outgoing current. So I three should be equal to I one plus I two. So it should be seven amperes in this case. Now this process of addition we are doing. This is which kind of addition? This is scalar addition. This is the scalar sum. So that means whenever we combine electric currents, we do it according to the principles of scalar algebra. Okay. So that means electric current is which kind of quantity? It is scalar. So this is a very good way to self-test. You know, whenever we have some confusion. If a certain physical quantity is a vector or a scalar, we should just ask ourselves that how can we add two values on that quantity? If we need the direction to add them, like do we need the angle theta between these two wires? We don't know. We always know that the angle theta be the two wires might be perpendicular to each other. Okay, they might be at some obtuse angle to each other. It doesn't matter. In all cases, क्या होगा? Theta 90 हो या theta obtuse हो या theta acute हो कैसा भी होगा. In all cases, I one plus I two will always give you seven. If this is five and this is two, not give you anything else. That that just gives us a simple proof or simple logical explanation why electric current is a scalar quantity. Okay, people. So hope this this definition is clear. Now now let's do a problem which is slightly more tricky than this. Okay. So next example, what is happening is that. particle makes a displacement of 10 kilometers towards east followed by another displacement of 30 root 2 kilometers towards north east or what i mean by north east is 45 degrees north of east and also this 30 root 2 is approximately 13 to 1.5 That's approximately forty-two kilometers. So approximately, but we take it as thirty root. So now we have to find the magnitude of its net displacement. नेट डिस्प्लेसमेंट का मैग्नीट्यूड कितना है जस्ट ट्राई टू विजुअलाइज दिस प्रॉब्लम सो इट्स इट्स नॉट सो इजी लाइक द कपल ऑफ प्रॉब्लम्स यू डन बिफोर आई विल हैव टू डू अ लिटिल बिट मोर वर्क ओवर हियर बट द हिंट टू यू इज दैट यू कैन स्टिल यूज द वेरी सिमिलर काइंड ऑफ प्रिंसिपल्स दैट वी डिड अर्लियर ऑफ पाइथागोरस थ्योरम राइट एंगल ट्रायंगल्स एटसेट्रा यू शुड बी एबल टू ब्रेक डाउन द प्रॉब्लम जस्ट यू हैव टू ट्राई अगेन Yeah, you did some kind of calculation. It's okay. Just try again. Just take your time.
okay, I'll just make the diagram for you and then it will become clear. I think it's just a matter of getting the geometry correct. So again, if our reference directions are like this, I take my x-axis along west to east and south to north. So we do what S1. First displacement is 10 kilometers towards east, and the second one is 30 root 2 kilometers towards northeast. So you can just take a you know coordinate geometry kind of approach. So suppose this is my starting point. So from here, I'm first making a displacement of 10 kilometers in this direction. So this is S1. Then I'm doing what? I'm going in the northeast direction. So northeast points are direction. S a direction 45 degrees north of east. So from this point, I'm making that displacement. So I will reach here. Some direction like this. Okay, Karan, if you're not able to see the whiteboard, uh, you can do one thing. Just log out once and log back in. Your whiteboard should get refreshed. Just log out of Zoom and log log in again. Okay, sometimes it happens because of network error. Okay, so we yes, SI. Okay, just a minute. Just a minute, yes. So further, this angle is 45. Now what is my net displacement in this figure? The net displacement is this one. This is my net displacement. That is the magnitude of the net displacement which I have to calculate. So ultimately it's about solving a triangle. The only problem is it's not directly a right angle triangle, but I can reduce it to a, this is the final position. No, still not got it. Okay. So now you see, what I'll do in this figure is, first I will solve the smaller right angle triangle. Okay. So let, let me just draw this once again. I will concentrate on one thing at a time. So, this 30 root 2 high coordinates. So, now this base is how much? And this is perpendicular. How much? 30 will be each. So, concentrate on this right angle triangle. So, this will come out to be how much? This will come out to be 30. And this will come out to be 30. Okay. And this was 10. In kilometers. So now concentrate on the full thing. So now concentrate on the larger right angle triangle. So this is what I have to calculate. 
एस में यहां की मुझे पता है कि I just continue this and drop a perpendicular from here. I know that this is 30, this is 30, and this one is 10. So, what about this whole thing? This base is how much? It's 40 kilometers. And this perpendicular is 30 kilometers. So what about, okay, so now, now you're getting my point, now concentrate on the larger triangle, concentrate on this whole triangle, this whole triangle. So how much is the hypotenuse? It is square root of 40 square plus 30 square, that is 10 square root of 16 plus 9, that's 50. So the answer was the net displacement is 50 kilometers. Okay. Understood now. So Karan, you are uh, able to understand, I mean, you're getting the whiteboard and the voice now. Okay, good. Yeah, to degrees I'll tell you. Uska is a specific method. We use the trigonometry for finding the degrees. Okay, Karan. So, we use a function called tan inverse and all that. We'll discuss. You are already familiar with the basics of trigonometry. Like for example, you know tan 30, sine 30, etc. Okay. So, but in this question, are, are all of you clear with the magnitude of displacement? How we have got 50 kilometers? Okay, good. Okay. So these are examples of basically what we call vector algebra. So though we haven't started vectors formally in that sense, and we haven't written any formula and all that, but today through these examples, we have already seen how to do some situations of vector addition. Now what we have done in the above examples, in the above examples, we have actually done an operation called vector addition okay. where you know so far what we have learned for example in one example we saw that we have seen that if s1 is 2 kilometers and s2 is 1.5 kilometers and they are opposite. They are opposite each other. Ek east ke tha, dusre west ke tha. Then the net displacement actually became 0.5. Okay. Then we saw an example where S1 was again 2, S2 was again 1.5, but they were perpendicular to each other. So we saw that if they are perpendicular to each other, their net became how much? It became 2.5. was this and this was this and they are perpendicular to each other okay. then the net actually became 2.5 so we'll actually see that generally speaking if s1 is some e in magnitude s2 is some b and they are perpendicular that is they are at 90 degrees to each other then always the net displacement will be given by this formula be same as Pythagoras theorem. We'll see that whenever they are opposite to each other, 
कि whenever they are opposite, S1 का कितना भी magnitude हो, S2 का कितना भी magnitude हो, but if they are opposite each other, then the net will become their difference. Okay. And likewise, we saw in the third example that if we took two vectors of magnitude ten and ten, sorry, thirty. Root two kilometers, and they were at theta equal to forty-five degrees with each other now because one was pointing east. Okay. That was one S one, and my S two, in comparison, was pointing towards northeast. The okay. northeast ke tarafa S two. So what was the angle between them? The angle between them was forty-five degrees. It was neither ninety nor one eighty nor anything like that. So in this case, we saw that the resultant of these two <coughs> excuse me, became how much? It became 50. We saw that the net displacement in this case became 50. But his explanation was a little bit more complicated. We actually had to draw the diagram, break it into two triangles, use uh, Pythagoras theorem twice you know, in the two right angle triangles. And we came to the conclusion that it is 50 kilometers. But nonetheless, all these three examples that we've done, they are actually cases of what we call vector addition, which is a process we will see in more detail and in more technical language uh, from the next lecture onwards. Okay, so this is where we conclude today's lecture, and uh, it's like an introduction to vectors. Nothing that serious today. Okay, but uh, from next time onwards, uh, we will understand more technically about uh, vector algebra, and we'll see how first of all to represent vectors uh, using a certain kind of notation, and then we will see various types of formulae. For doing different type of vector operations, including vector addition, which we have done today. So we will learn some formulae, etc., which are related to things like trigonometry and Pythagoras theorem. And from there onwards, our uh, study of vectors will progress. Okay. So again, you have understood why vectors is important in physics because in physics we are always dealing with physical quantities affecting each other, and physical quantities are not always scalars. Many of them are vectors. So we need to understand how to combine or how to do operations with these type of physical quantities which are called vectors. And that is why vector algebra becomes a very important chapter for us. In fact, that becomes the first chapter of our um, class 11, 12 physics. All right. So as I was saying, that's it for today's lecture, guys. Hope you have understood the lecture and enjoyed it. Uh, I will... Uh, yes, uh, to answer your question, just uh, YouTube... Uh, Channels are divided into houses. So, yeah, so you, you will also be having a specific channel for your group of TP Bhatia. Okay? Just like you have seen the red house, blue house, etc. channels uh, for, for the different groups of students. So, like that, your, your group of uh, students from TP Bhatia Integrated College will also have a specific channel, and all the videos will be up on that channel. Okay, so thanks for attending, guys. Bye, and all the best. And any doubt comes up in between when you are revising, etc. You can always send me a message uh, personally on WhatsApp. Okay, through through the number you have my WhatsApp number on the group, so you can send me any doubt at any point of time. Okay, wish you all the best and thanks for attending, people.